All right. Um, yeah, I think let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's see. Um, um, so I'm going to start off. I think uh, I did post um, an update for Sonnet 3 last week. Um, I, uh, I mentioned I encourage people to get started on it, uh, but yeah, I think I'm going to start with that. So uh, see if I can clarify if there's any questions. Uh, anybody has any questions that we can uh, um, uh, discuss uh, on what you need to do for the assignment three. Um, and then, you know, so we are working on, we're still working on the chapter four or five um, uh, the section on logistic regression this week. So we'll go over logistic regression a bit. Um, and uh, kind of as a reminder, I think I mentioned this before, but uh, we are going to be having our first test next week uh, we'll give more information about that um but um but uh, yeah you might want to start thinking about that reviewing for it so a good th it, it's going to be um questions similar to the, the previous two assignments so there's going to be questions on linear regression logistic regression maybe do a polynomial regression so that probably the best thing to do would be do assignment three and, and review assignment two and three uh, as you start thinking about the uh, the test so, We'll get more information about that, though. Um, okay, so there, there, you know, I did post this. Uh, there was some initial problems. Somebody found it out, uh, but uh, you should be able to see the updated um, assignment uh, as of like uh, Friday. Uh, there is there were two files that were modified, so there was a C a new CSV file. Um, um, so make sure you are updating and using the correct data file or else you'll have problems uh, as well as, as a new notebook for the assignment three. Uh, just go ahead and open it up here. Um, So, let's see. Um, I mean, you know, an easy way to check is that uh, make certain that you are putting your name and, and stuff at the top when you do these, uh, but uh, uh, you should have one with the date for um, um, uh, this uh, semester here at the end of this week. Um, um, I guess if you want to double check the data file, might be a good idea, although, yeah, that might be a little bit tough to make certain you got the right one, uh, besides make certain you download it. Um, but you guys that are here, I mean, um, even if you have an old one, it'll be 100 uh, samples with uh, two columns labeled X and Y. But um, I guess, you know, if you want to write it down or take a quick picture, you should be using the one that has 0.69. Uh, and 1.28 uh, is the first uh, sample um, for this uh, assignment here. Um, that will differ if you using a different uh, data file there. Um, all right, so just a few hints or some suggestions about this. I already had somebody ask about, um, uh, wasn't able to run this cell here. Uh, so for me, for the, the current most recent version of Matplotlib, um, they're kind of transitioning out of the, uh, uh, the Seaborn styles. I think they're not gonna have them in there anymore. But yeah, if this cell doesn't run for you, uh, on one, on, in one sense, it's not really a big deal. I mean, you can go ahead and um, uh, just import, you'll just get a warning, but uh, you should still have that. Uh, but the other thing though, is that that probably means you're not using the same versions of Matplotlib and the other libraries. So you might wanna go back and check. That's potentially more of a, that's 
potentially a bigger issue than uh, you know whether you can use this uh, particular style or not for this notebook. If you're using an older version of Matplotlib, you might not get this warning, but there might be slight differences. Probably, you know, I've talked about this before. Probably you'll be fine, but um, you know, it's a good thing to try and match those. So there are the version numbers that are being used in the reference environment um, were posted for the class and um, 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 uh, other things that you might want to check. Um, this assignment three, um, you're going to be doing pretty much like the same stuff that you had in the lecture notebook on the polynomial regression. Okay, so what I, I did was I gave you a data set that has a secret function that is um, generating the sample data. Um, so I'm sure it's mentioned in here. I mean, the secret function uh, is a polynomial. It's definitely more than like a degree two uh, quadratic polynomial, but somewhere less than 15 or 20, or probably a lot less than, than 20, um, right? So part of the assignment is going to be that um, you're going to be uh, loading in the data, doing a little bit of exploration, uh, but then using some of the stuff we learned about regularization and uh, fitting a polynomial uh, regression to the data to try and, you know, I mean, you know, get a good model, try and estimate what the true function is, right? So, so you know, unlike the lecture notebooks that you might have been that, that you should have been using, uh, you won't know what the true function is. So you're going to have to do some exploration and fitting um, and try and determine some things um, given uh, the the data that you were given here. So, um, so I didn't ask you to do too much. Um, in fact, I didn't give you an example, but you should load the data, uh, make certain that you you know there, there's I already showed you there's only two. Uh, features. So, so one of them is going to be used as the, uh, the feature, and the other one you're going to have to pull out. That's the label for the regression target. Uh, they're just labeled X and Y for this data here. So there's not a whole lot to do, but you should describe, you should look at the, uh, should make certain that you get 100 samples, um, take a look at what the ranges are of the two columns that you had in that data. Uh, do any data preparation that you have. Go ahead and visualize it. So create a plot like you should be familiar with at this point, where you give a scatter plot that should give you an idea of what the data is that you're looking at, uh, that you're working with uh, on this assignment here. So make certain you're labeling your axes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so um, I basically then ask you to create an underfit model then create a model that's highly overfit of the data uh, and then use um, ridge and lasso regularization uh, to try and learn a little bit more about the model um, for the assignment, okay? So um, I encourage you, that there should be examples of all these. I encourage you to go ahead and um, uh, use a pipeline for this data. I don't remember if I've talked about that um, uh, when we went through the, the lecture notebooks, uh, but let me um, just show, you know, all, all this stuff should have relatively good examples of doing uh, these things that are asked for in the assignment. Um, so I think in the lecture notebooks, uh, I mean, sometimes but when we first talked about fitting a polynomial, we just showed uh, uh, directly creating the polynomial features class and then using it um, and then fitting uh, um, a logistic regression to those new set of features. But there are also some examples of uh, creating pipeline. Uh, let's see if there's a good one in here somewhere. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes we did just directly do that, but you probably for this assignment want to skip over that um, and always use um, uh, pipelines like this. So once we got down to talking about um, the regularization, uh, we started using the pipeline. Okay. So if, if I didn't mention that before, uh, these are really powerful. Um, uh, in this case, though, you can basically... Um, um, have it so that it will always, you know, uh, create, it'll first create the 
uh, you know, add the, the polynomial features, the data set, and you just give it the original data set with a single feature. When it goes to the pipeline, like in this example, um, uh, it'll first generate the other uh, degree two through 100 features for the data set, uh, and then send that in to fit a linear regression. So after that, you can use that pipeline mostly in similar ways that you would just use the, uh, a straightforward linear regression object. So you can fit a model to it. You, you can pass that into the learning curves function to plot the learning curves. Um, 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 you can fit a model. Um, so yeah, if you look at the examples in the regularization, um, there's a lot of things where, you know, where you have pipeline, where we fit a model. Uh, one thing, uh, one of the things I ask for you to do is after you fit a model to all the data, so uh, like for the underfit model, uh, you should create a pipeline um, and you should fit a degree two polynomial. So you want to have a pipeline that just creates degree two quadratic features. Right? So this should underfit because the actual degree of the secret function is much bigger than two, all right? Um, um, and yeah, I ask you to fit it to all the data here if it's not clear. So when you do this step, and when you report the intercept and the coefficients, uh, fit it to all the data. Um, I'm not certain, there may or may not be a good example. So if you have a pipeline here, after you fit it, sometimes you can call functions directly uh, like, like I need to get the intercept and the coefficients, but uh, but yeah, for the intercept and the coefficients, you can't call it on your pipeline object. Um, and um, so, um, I mean, sometimes you can, like you, the, some functions uh, work for the whole pipeline, like predict and things, but other times uh, you have to specifically, yeah, so there are some examples of that in there. So for example, uh, so I already did have those out there. If you need to be to access the intercept and the coefficient, like to ask for, if you have a pipeline object, you have to extract out the the particular part of the pipeline after you fit it, right? So the way to do that, if it wasn't clear, I, I know I didn't talk about this, but um, um, like like here, basically uh, a, a kind of a dictionary is created. So the first part is really just a string or a name. So if I have to access the individual parts of the pipeline, I can use that as the key to pull out. So if I, if I, if I want to pull out the polynomial features uh, object, I can use the poly, poly features key to pull it out. But you will need to pull out the um, uh, object you use to do to fit a regression, right? So in this one, if I need to pull out the ridge regression that was fit after I fit the model, um, I can use that as a key. Once you have that, then you can call anything that you can on that ridge object, you know, with the intercept and the coefficients and other stuff that's only specifically um, a member function of, of a um, ridge regression or linear regression object, all right? So, you know, um, uh, but you will need to to, to do that. I mean, I, I definitely recommend you really should be using pipelines for all the, the things on this assignment three. Uh, but in, for some of the things then when you need to pull them out, um, you will have to get to the individual. Sometimes you can use the whole pipeline for other things and you'll have to do some reading, some documentation or look at the examples to figure out uh, when you need to get the specific component of the pipeline versus when you can use the whole pipeline to do whatever you need. Right? I do ask for all of these. Um, so I ask you to do after loading the data, you're going to be like fitting uh, and doing learning curves, uh, repeating that like four times, one, two, three, four, basically. Uh, uh, all four of these tasks though should be hopefully relatively quick once you, have, once you figure out how to do one of them because you can do, do the same thing, but with just a slightly different model. So first first with an underfit model, so like a degree two polynomial, and then second do the same thing, but with a degree 100 polynomial, uh, and then third do it with a um, lasso regression, and then fourth do it with a ridge uh, lasso regularization, and then do it with, with a ridge regularization. Right? Um, 
but uh, but yeah, I do ask you to report. You do need to also correctly calculate the R squared and the root mean squared error uh, on your fitted model. Again, do that on all the data. So don't do any train test split, at least not um, um, up through the first five or six parts here. So, so just fit it on all the data um, and report R squared and RMSE on all the data um, after you fit your model. Um, and, um, you know, I, I copied the learning curves function for you, but just reuse that like we did in our lecture notebooks to also plot the learning curves for the underfit, overfit, lasso, ridge, ridge models, models that we train on the data set. Right? Um, um, let me know if, if people have questions or want me to clarify things on the assignment here. So, um, I did. Uh, uh, recommend add in uh, always set the random seed before you plot your learning curves. That'll that'll ensure that you'll end up generating the same ones that um, I'm expecting to generate, assuming that your model is fit approximately the way it should be. So, um, but this will also just help as you're trying trying things out yourself. That uh, so if you don't do that every time you fit, uh, the the learning curves can look slightly different. So this way, usually that's more of a distraction. So if, if you plot, if you set the seed, you don't have to worry about how it changes it, 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 because of how I randomly split things when I uh, plot the learning curves. So, um, let's see. So yeah, and um, for. I did ask you to play around with uh, Lasso. So uh, you will have to try and figure out a good value of none of that, that parameter called alpha, uh, which controls how much regularization is used. So there's an alpha parameter both for Lasso and Ridge regularization. Um, so you, know, you, you will need to explore a little bit and try to find a good one. So your goal here is described but um, um, you're going to be using, again, a degree 100 polynomial, but from underfitting and overfitting, you should have some idea of what you should be able to reach on R squared and R and SE for a good fit model. Right? So from the overfit model, that will give you some information about um, um, what is possible, or at least what I should be able to get close to on like the R and SE score, but for a model that's fitting well instead of being overfit. We discussed that a little bit last week. Uh, so that's kind of your goal. So you might have to, to explore some different values of alpha to find a good one. But your, your goal is to find a good one um, that gets R squared and RMSE that fit that that approach what you get for the overfit model, but doesn't show signs of overfitting. Right, so uh, that that seems to be fitting well, and again, the way you can tell if it's fitting well um, is looking at those learning curves. So, um, um, so something that's uh, fitting well or underfitting uh, will usually have those curves converging. Whereas something that is overfitting uh, will take longer, where longer is relative, but, but um, will take more amounts of data before, or, or maybe never. Uh, so you might never see convergence depending on what you're doing, um, or, or at least a longer amount of time, more amount of data for your training set size. Um, right. But in this case, you know, just to, to review stuff we talked about last Thursday, uh, even though it's overfitting, this gives you some idea of performance you can expect for a well-fit model that you can achieve like the RMSE, the, the root mean squared error uh, here. So once you try to fit a good model, uh, you should see convergence, but converging down at uh, somewhere closer to the RMSE than you would get for an underfit model, All right? Um, so that's that's kind of your your goal or your task there. Um, although um, um, I do ask you to do a little bit of writing on this, and I'm going to be grading it this time. 
Uh, what I want, so, so make certain that, uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before, so, you know, don't put this in code as like a comment in a code block. Use the uh, use the markup, the markdown cell here. So, you know, I want your discussion here, but I also want you to fill out this table here with the results that you get, right? So you should be able to report the R squared in our MSE for the under 50 old fit, uh, the last in the ridge. Uh, as well as the alpha that you can use to achieve the, the R squared for your last image. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, and you know as a maybe as kind of a hint for a good student, uh, it might even be maybe I should have asked you, asked you to do this, but uh, you might want to show maybe more than one alpha for your last image to show me that you some things that you tried, right? So it might be a good idea to find uh, a lasso that's too big. So you're getting something that looks like it's um, um, uh, still overfitting too much, but one that's too small. So it looks like you've gone to underfitting range before you found something that is in between. Right? Uh, what you should expect here, if you're doing things right, is you should expect that um, your RMSE and your R squared looks it might not be it might not be able to get as good as the overfit model, but you should be able to get somewhere in the range of the overfit model for your performance for your regularized models here for your RMSEs if you find good values of alpha um, on this. Right? Um, definitely all of these should look better than uh, what you get for the underfit model. All right. Uh, and then yeah, I do ask you to, to discuss, right? It might be a good idea, like I said. For your discussion if you want it to be better and then i will be taking points so i will be kind of ranking these and um, taking points for uh, minimal discussions or bad discussions versus things that are more um, complete so but you want you do want to you know try and do things like observe what you had maybe describe what you did what what values that you um, explored um what you're seeing for performance stuff like that you know, in, in your discussion here um, another thing I um, I didn't require it I didn't ask for it uh, but, but after I posted this I got the thinking that maybe I should have also asked you to visualize the fit of your uh, model that might help with your discussion I, I didn't ask for it in there but another thing you might want to do is um, you know, um, uh, if, if, if you have time, um, so we showed examples of that, uh, try, you won't have the true function, but try, you might, it might even be um, worthwhile to do it on one plot, maybe, maybe not, but try visualizing the raw data um, and, and like maybe your underfit and your overfit model and your regularized models that might help you think about um, um that, that might help with the discussion, but uh, I didn't require that, but um, you might want to consider doing that. Um, all right, but but yeah, I do ask for um, basically four things. It's repetition four times and then summarize that and give me some discussion. This one here. Um, all right. And then I did ask you to do some more, although I gave this to you. Um, so, um, um, the advanced students might already be familiar with using grid search. I have shown that before. Um, that, but don't, don't try, try and avoid jumping right to the grid search. If you know, if you know what I'm talking about here, if you've used grid search before, uh, so to try and find some good values for alpha, um, by by uh, doing model by hand, by fitting some model by hand, so exploring things. But then uh, at the end, um, um, I do ask you to try and do a grid search. Um, uh, I ask you to do two grid searches, one over the alpha for uh, a, a lasso model. But uh, the second one I asked, I, I give an example, you really don't have to do anything for the second one. You, you can just, you should be able to just run the code. Um, but um, but um, this was to show you how to do a grid search over creating polynomials with different degrees, right? So uh, most likely, if you do the assignment right, you should find that uh, this will be uh, 
the, the best model that you do because this will determine the right degree of the secret function rather than trying to use regularization to trim off uh, parameters that aren't useful. So, so often the best performance you'll get um, in terms of a model is in this case, since the secret function is using some polynomial to generate the data, uh, uh, doing a search. So, so, so uh, but what I was getting at, what you have to do here is to do a similar kind of a grid search, but over the alpha parameters instead of over the polynomial. So a lot of this, um, if you haven't done the, use the grid CV before, you still figure it out. Uh, by looking at the example over the polynomial function. It's a little bit easier to do it over to alpha rather than uh, this. So in this case, to do it over the polynomial features, you have to create like a, a, um, a helper function that can be called with the degree of the polynomial feature. So this creates a pipeline like you should have been doing for parts two through five, uh, but it'll, it'll create it for a specified number of specify the degree of the polynomial in the pipeline. But then using that, you can set up um, a grid search over, in this case, a grid search over all possible polynomial regressions from a degree two up to degree 100 um, and do a grid search over that um, um, to find the one that has the best performance. Okay. But you have to do pretty much the same thing. Oh, oh and um, there's also a link. Um, um, since I don't think our textbook, our textbook does also talk a little bit about grid CV or hands-on machine learning. Uh, and I have it in some of my lecture notebooks, but uh, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of good. This is a, I, I thought was a pretty good tutorial on uh, from um, um, from, uh, yeah, towards data science has lots of good if you've never found this site before. There's lots of good resources on um, uh, using the scikit-learn and stuff. So. Um, let's see, what else? I think that was it. Oh, um, maybe one final hint on this. Uh, because of the way a grid search works, and it's probably discussed in that tutorial in our textbook, but um, um, you actually have to say that I want to use the negative mean squared error um, in order to determine, you know, when it's doing the cross validation to determine uh, which uh, things that are searching are doing well and which things are doing uh, poorly. Um, but uh, uh, for all the assignment before this, we use the root mean squared error. So the things that are reported as a negative mean squared error, if you want to go back and report those as the, the root mean squared error, you'd have to convert that from negative mean squared error to root mean squared error. So slightly different, but uh, but if you want to show these or, or um, compare these back to what you did for the first few parts, you would have to um, 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 get those back into the, the same um, uh, fitness function that we were using for our evaluations. All right. Um, yeah. So I think that was everything I wanted to mention. Any, anybody? Is there anything that's unclear on that? Some more information on that. So you know. Um, um, so I. So you should have. I mean, hopefully, you have enough time. I, I do want this by Friday so that we can keep our test um, scheduled for next week as well. Um, so um, like I was saying, you know, I don't think, once you do one of these, you're gonna be doing pretty much the same kind of stuff for the rest of them, um, uh, just fitting with uh, either different polynomial function or using different kind of regularization. So, although, yeah, I take that back. So then that form five, you might do a little bit extra exploration. So um, I would try and try and do it by hand. So, so try and, uh, figure out some good values of alpha yourself uh, before you kind of skip down and, and do a more systematic search using like a grid, uh, using the grid uh, um, search CV. Um, all right. Um,
All right, yep, that's, uh, that's assignment three. So let me know if people have questions on that as you're working on it. We talk more about it on, on Thursday, um, although, you know, I'll see. But, but yeah, if, uh, definitely, if you haven't started on it, try and start on it um, and bring questions on Thursday if you come up to something that you're not certain about or um, um, get stuck on. Um, um, all right. Um, so I want to go ahead and, and move on to logistic regression. I uh, don't know if I had anything to summarize on the regularization. Um, we did cover pretty well last time the regularization, although I, I didn't uh, spend a lot of time on talking about like uh, other stuff besides the ridge and the lasso. Those are the main ones that you'll need to understand for the assignment. Um, so let's let's go ahead and uh, look at logistic regression then. Um, so the last section uh, of chapter four uh, then gets into logistic regression. Um, so to review a little bit, remember we've, we've been doing regression um, mostly. Uh, so for assignment three, we're actually back to doing regression. We have looked at classification before, right? So the the... What we're talking about here when we move on to logistic regression in chapter four is um, how do we build a model that can do a classification task instead of a regression task? Okay? And as I say many times, I mean, you know, the, the name initially um, confuses people because it's called log logistic regression for historical kind of reasons, but logistic regression is really our first example where we're going to look at the details. Uh, how we can define a fitness function to do a classification, right? So we'll start back with using binary classification. So, so we'll look at a, um, a task where we have, we're trying to predict either yes, no, or you know, some, some label that has um, uh, two values um, and go from there, right? So um, the problem is, is that the, um, the, like the, the mean squared error fitness function that we were using for regression does not work well. I mean, you could, you could apply it, right? So we could try and predict a value, uh, you know, so have a model that, that gives a, a value, and then we could just do the, the difference between it and the label, which would be like zero or one, um, and calculate the, the, the sum of the squared errors. Right? Um, you could do that, but um, um, it doesn't uh, work as well um, when we're trying to do a binary classification right, for reasons that uh, we'll talk about here or that if you've read, um, you should um, have gotten some ideas about. Um, so, yeah, uh, so, you know, we will start with just binary classification. So you can, uh, we already talked about this uh, when we talked about classification before. Everything we talk about here, we can extend to doing a multi-class classification later on. For logistic regression, normally what we do is we just build multiple logistic regressions and then combine the results into a multi-labeled output um, using one versus many or one versus one, like we talked about. Um, although there's a, a, a different method using SoftMax, which um, probably won't talk about today, but um, um, we can discuss that. Um, um, so the first idea is that one of the problems with just applying straightforward uh, root mean squared error is that there's nothing that constrains the output, which is what you want. So for a regression task, I mean, you're, you're trying to predict just a real value number. So, you know, the, like, like house prices could range from $10,000 to a million dollars, right? Or anywhere in between. So you want the, the output, your prediction to be unconstrained and you want it to learn the right kind of uh, range um, from applying your fitness function, right? But for, um, um, for a binary classification task, uh, there's always only gonna be two labels, either zero or one, right? So uh, it makes sense right up front to restrict 
my output um, so that my predictions are always a value zero or one or somewhere in between is what we're going to do here, right? Um, so that's that's the first idea that's introduced uh, in our textbook is the sigmoid function. Okay, so instead of um, outputting, so here before, um, this is what we were doing for linear regression is we were just taking our theta parameters that we were trying to fit, multiplying them times our inputs, and that was our hypothesis, right? Um, and then, you know, we already talked about that the way we find the good set of theta parameters is by defining a fitness function and then using an optimization factor. For, what, for whatever set of parameters you have, you just take those, multiply them times the input, that's going to be your hypothesis for linear regression. So what we're going to modify for logistic regression is we'll do the same thing. We'll have the same ideas is we've got um, our some number of input features. So at the simplest, you can just think of this as X is just one feature. Um, and you've got the parameter, the parameters. Uh, so to, to have an hypothesis, we'd multiply those. But uh, instead of allowing that value to be used directly, we'll put it through this logistic function or the sigmoid function. Right. So if you're not familiar with this, um, this is the, the sigmoid function. All it does, if, if you look at the example here, so any value uh, that's really small negative, um, um, so like if you plug negative 10 in here, so here's Z um, is the only value that's a parameter um, for this notation for the sigmoid here. So if you plug in like a negative 10, uh, you're going to get a value zero or close to zero. So you can see that as you get more and more negative, it never gets exactly zero, but it gets closer and closer to zero going in that direction for the sigmoid function. And on the other end, the, the, the bigger the number, the more positive it is, the, the closer it gets to one, right? But the effect is, is that if you put it through the sigmoid function, it squashes, you know, whatever the range was, it can go from negative infinity to positive infinity, but they get squashed to some value between zero and one which is really what you want for binary classification right? because my, my target, my label is going to be either zero or one. Um, so um, this, this helps a lot um, um, to build a logistic, uh, to, to build a, a classifier, um, to squash it through the sigmoid here first, right? Um, some other properties to notice about this. So uh, basically zero is kind of used as the threshold for the default uh, sigmoid here. So when it's zero, the output is actually 0.5, right? Uh, and um, you know, we've run across this concept before. If we are using the default sigmoid, we will usually use 0.5 as a threshold. Uh, so what that means is for like the inputs, um, any value that's less than zero um, is going to get squashed to a value that's less than 0.5 after the sigmoid, um, and we will um, um, threshold that to a zero or the false case, usually. And any value that's greater than zero um, is going to, once it goes to the sigmoid, we'll be end up with a result that's greater than 0.5. So we're usually threshold at 0.5, and that'll get uh, predicted as one. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, results other than zero and one are possible going through the sigmoid. So for, for now, you can think of those as kind of an estimate of how certain, um, our classifier is, right? So, um, if it's really certain, you want to try and drive it to get a really negative, if it's really certain that it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a false, that, that I should be predicting false you want your classifier to try and get a really large negative number so that when it goes to the sigmoid, you get something really close to zero. And if you're, if, if, um, you're really certain that it uh, should be, uh, I should be predicting one or positive, you want to try to get a really big number so as to get close to one. If you're not certain, you want it to be closer to zero. Um, so that, um, that gives you some idea that um, I you know maybe I'm a little bit above 0.5, so I'm going to predict a one, but I'm not all that certain about it. Uh, my prediction might not be very good. So, um, all right.
So yeah, that was more about this. So, so normally the way that we use this, um, I mean, we are going to threshold this and the default is to use 0.5. So after it goes to the sigmoid, uh, less than 0.5, our prediction, the Y hat predictions will be zero. If it's greater than 0.5, um, it'll be one. Right. But that also implies that, um, you know, um, um, if you look at the original Z before going through the sigmoid, if the output is less than zero, uh, those are going to be, when we threshold it, uh, will end up being mapped to um, um, a negative prediction. And if the result before we go through the sigmoid is greater than zero, um, those will get mapped to uh, one when we do our prediction function and we threshold it. The further away it is from zero, the more confident we'll be, and the closer it is, the less confident, you know, we'll be closer to 0.5, closer to the threshold value that we're going to use to do this. Um, so yeah, that, that was described there. So when z is less than zero, um, we're actually making a prediction of, of zero, the negative case, and when, when the z is greater than zero, um, the output prediction will be one by the default threshold that we use. Um, So given that, um, I won't talk about justifying why we do this, but um, instead of using, you know, the, the the difference. So here, you know, our, our our prediction could be a number between zero and one. And again, like I was saying, we could, you know, um, do the same, just do the difference between our prediction and the label, square those and sum them up. But we're gonna do something slightly different. Um, Uh, so what we want is uh, we're, we're we're developing a, a new cost function, the uh, the logistic cost function here, um, which is the the common classical one that's used for logistic regression. So basically, if um, if the true value is one, uh, we want our cost function to be low whenever our prediction. Um, um, is close to one, right? And we want this cost to be high whenever, uh, you know, true value is one. If our prediction is close to zero, we want the cost function to be high, right? And we want to reverse that for the other one. So for a binary classification where, where the true label is supposed to be false or zero, uh, we want that cost to be high uh, whenever, you know, our predictions are closer to one and we want it to be low or zero when our predictions are correct when it's close to zero. So this notation is saying kind of that, but but in a, a formal way, right? Uh, or, you know, to me, it's it's easier to visualize this. So for example, uh, here, when, when the true label is one, this is what the cost function looks like. So when the true label is one, um, if the output is one, um, so if you just take the negative log of your output, the output is one, the negative log of that is zero, right? Which is what, what you want. Um, so, you know, for the true label being one, Y is one. If I'm predicting one, I want the cost to be zero, close to zero as I can. And, and the further, you know, if I get down here and predicting zero, close to zero, I want the cost to become bigger and bigger. So a good cost function is big when you're making bad predictions and it's, it's zero or close to zero when you're making good predictions. And that's what this is capturing here, the negative of the log of our um, output. Right? So p hat is the output from the sigmoid, if, it, if that wasn't clear on that. Uh, but you know that doesn't work uh, when, when the true label is a zero, right? So I need to reverse that. So that's why it's the one minus. So, so this is a, a what was it called? A, a stepwise function here, as we'll see in a second. <laughs> So I want to do the same, but the reverse. So for every time when I want to try and predict zero, I need to take one minus that. So that um, if I want to predict a zero, I get a zero cost when P is zero. Um, and if I want to predict a zero, but um, I'm, I'm predicting something really big, I want the cost to be really big. Because uh, I'm making bad predictions in that case. Um, So I guess I, I, don't, I don't remember if the textbook discussed this. Uh, I kind of skipped right to the 
putting that all together here, but uh, let's unpack the notation a little bit. So this is really just using those ideas, but we're defining a single cost function using these, what are known as logits or logistic functions or a cost function here. So, uh, so remember, so Y is the true value, right? So when Y is one, this term will be in there, but, but when Y is one, this will become zero and this will go away, right? So this represents the places where the true label is one for an input sample. Right, so we've got M samples as usual here. We're summing up over these, right? So this, this computes all the times where Y is one using uh, the, the one that we had up there. Uh, but when Y is zero, that'll go away and we'll just have that. Uh, but that'll give us what we want, but for those where the, the, the thing is zero. Right? Um, so anyway, that'll apply that the, the log correctly or you know, our binary label zero one. So we just sum that up like we did for the sum of squares. But here, you know, we're not summing up the square errors. We're summing up the, the, the logits uh, based on our label of zero one here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and the notation makes it work even though we've got two distinct binary labels. Because uh, only one or the other works depending on whether the, the true label is one or the true label is zero. So hopefully that's clear. Hopefully, hopefully you guys get that right. The result of that is, you know, like we did for linear regression, uh, this gives me um, um, a measure of how well, you know, so if I have M samples, like if M is 100 uh, and all the samples have, you know, the, the, the true label, you know, we're, we're doing... Um, supervised learning here as we've been doing so far in this class. So, so I've got hundred samples. Every sample has a binary label of one or zero. Uh, I can sum up uh, how well for any prediction I'm doing. So what's one thing that's hidden here is, uh, you know, um, uh, we have to have some function that generates my hypothesis, which is P hat in this notation, right? So I have to have something that is generating P hat uh, which is a value between zero and one um, that I can sum up to get my my cost using the logit function here. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know if I should go into this. If if you are a careful or astute student, you might the, the notation is slightly different from the the presentation of the textbook. Um, uh, one of the main reasons is we're using zero-based indexing because that's the way Python does it. Or some mathematician will start at one, so you know, but it's equivalent if you go from one to m versus zero to n minus one. But this makes more sense um, uh, if we're using Python, where everything starts at index zero. If you want to translate this into uh, code, like NumPy code or Python code. Um, So, I'm not certain, I'm never certain how deep to go into this. I do have, uh, this is maybe a good point to, to mention. Um, uh, you know, there are uh, resources. Uh, I really like uh, Dr. Ng's lecture videos where he talks about the uh, logistic regression function um, here. So, if you want to get deeper into, um, how this works, um, and you might want to talk. You might want to watch Dr. Ng's videos on the linear and the logistic regression if you haven't been watching those. Um, but um, the 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 main jump uh, in the lecture notebook from here to here is the reason why we use those logits uh, is it's easy to uh, determine the derivatives. Um, uh, of those functions. Uh, like it's easy to, to do the derivatives of the square differences. So that's one reason why we use the squares for the regression. Uh, likewise, so you don't really have to, to know how to do it, but um, 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 we can analytically determine the derivatives of an expression like that using these logs. Now, uh, one thing I like to do is um, um, it's a, it, it, it's, a good thing to compare this 
to, we briefly also showed the derivative for the regression function before. Um, so that might've been in gradient descent, not this notebook. Um, so I think in the gradient descent notebook, we talked a little bit about you know the derivative and and how that's used for um, implementing a um, um, an optimization method right here. So th this is really the um, the derivative of the mean squared error function, right? So so look at that notation there. Right? Um, Basically, all we're saying is that the 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 gradient or the slope um, is is basically the the um, this is the hypothesis. So your theta times the the inputs for sample the i sample minus the true values. So that's really taking the, the difference, like we did for the squared difference. But instead of squaring, we just multiply that times the inputs again. That that is a term of the slope or the derivative of the function. That point, we can add those up to, to, to determine the gradient here to do gradient descent. Right. So compare that to um, um, the expression here. Right. You'll find so one reason, one of the answers to you know, why do we do this is again mathematically it's really nice. So when uh, if you look at this, it's almost exactly the same expressions right before. There's a few differences. The only real difference though is when we take the thetas times the x, we put it through the sigmoid function. Right? So that represents going to squashing it between zero and one. Uh, but yeah, but the derivative of our logit function before gives us pretty much the same expression. The only difference you have to do to calculate the gradients is, um, so you take your hypothesis, put it, squash it through the sigmoid function, subtract that, multiply by the inputs again, and that's an expression for your gradient. Uh, and again, uh, I, I think I've got some of this in this notebook, or Dr. Ng has some of that. So if you're interested, I do encourage you to uh, think about, I mean, it's, it's you, you might not understand if you've not gotten deep into a calculus kind of course, how you analytically, you know, get the expression for the derivative of a term like this to get that. But if you have that, that expression, it's pretty easy to implement gradient descent from that expression um, you know, to calculate the gradients uh, from this one for the logistic function. Uh, likewise, so there was an example for this one for the uh, regression function that I briefly showed uh, when, we, when we talked about the root mean squared error, right? So you pretty much could use exactly the same function here to calculate the gradients. Um, the only thing you have to do is just uh, yeah, put it through the sigmoid. So once you calculate your hypothesis, with this sigmoid and do the same stuff, and you'll get your gradients. And you can use that to do gradient descent in your logistic function here. Right. Um, so let me just step back on that, um, you know, uh, summarize a little bit some of those concepts here because. Um, if you didn't quite follow the steps I was going through there, uh, think back to when we talked about linear regression and gradient descent. So hopefully you, uh, uh, you know, you had enough of a grasp of what we were doing there and how gradient descent worked. Okay, so what we've done here um, is we've shown that um, um, we can do exactly the same thing. So we've defined a cost function that works better for binary data, binary class task here. Um, so, so this, this cost function uh, gives us an idea of for some theta, which is up here, the theta is hidden in the P in this notation. So really doing this uh, times sigma is what is used to calculate the P hat uh, that we had up above there, right? But so given some theta, I can use that to calculate the cost um, and then once I have the cost, that, that cost, because of how we define our cost function, is going to be high uh, if I'm making bad predictions, things that where the output isn't close to the zero or one 
that I want it to predict. And it should be low or getting close to zero when I'm making lots of good predictions. My outputs are close to the, the zero one label that I want it to predict. Right? And you know, given that, you know, I don't know what a good value of theta is, but I can just pick a random value of theta, calculate the cost. And since I can also have a term to calculate the gradients, I can use that to follow, um, you know, to do an optimization method uh, to follow the gradients down to the best possible values of theta um, that um, uh, you can achieve. That they'll give you the lowest cost for the data you're trying to collect. Right. So that's all part of gradient. Another thing, I, I, yeah, this is discussed here. So another reason is this function ends up being convex, like the the the, the derivative of the root mean squared error as well. So this one is well behaved. Um, again, these gradients, there'll be one global minimum, um, and you can easily use an optimization method, um, like linear regression. Um, to find the best data parameters. So uh, going forward in this class, we will look at some other machine learning methods where the cost function uh, doesn't, isn't guaranteed to be convex. Um, so they can have uh, uh, more than one minimum, right? But uh, linear regression and logistic regression have that nice property. So that's one of the reasons why they're, they're, they're usually the first method that you want to turn to when you're starting a regression task or a, a classification task. Use the simplest one, see how well it does, and then start looking at the um, um, more powerful techniques to see if you can improve on, uh, on, on the basic model like logistic regression. All right, so I hope, hope hopefully, you know, um, that's, um, is understandable, right? So, you know, at this point, if you understood everything we talked about, about gradient descent for linear regression, all that applies to this function as well. So all the same things can be done. Um, um, we can use gradient descent. Um, we can use uh, batching. We didn't talk about that a lot, but we can use full batches or uh, mini batches and do our gradient descent um, to determine a good uh, logistic regression model. So to determine the best parameters to fit our model, right? to fit our sample data. Um, oh yeah, and uh, I'm going faster than I was thinking. Um, um, I'll say a few things about decision boundaries and then I might leave the rest for later. Uh, so it might be a little bit early today. Uh, so we've already run across the concept of decision boundaries as well uh, in this class, although up to this point, um, um, they were, you're kind of, you were mostly given uh, how to visualize them or how to calculate them, right? So, uh, so, so now that we've learned about the logistic function um, and we've got some idea of how we would have a cost function so we can fit um, a classification model using logistic function to a set of data, uh, we can talk about what it means to visualize that, uh, what, it, what the decision boundary looks like. Right? And that goes back to the stuff I've already been talking about. So, you know, um, um, here for our sigmoid, uh, whatever parameters that you, you come up with when you fit your logistic regression, um, uh, Wherever that model outputs values less than zero or the sigmoid is less than 0.5, uh, if we're using that as the default, that's going to be the decision box. So everything on one side of that is going to end up being predicted as the zero or the false case, and everything on the other side would be the true case, right? So that's all that's happening um, uh, when we try and visualize the decision boundaries uh, in this part of the lecture notebook here. Um, So um, have we, uh, I don't know if we've talked about the Irish data set before uh, in the class. Maybe, maybe we've seen it before. Uh, so this is another common one that's used, uh, although it's much smaller than the MNIST. So it's really more for examples than uh, MNIST is big enough that you can illustrate um, more realistic kinds of properties of, of doing 
uh, modeling. Um, but, but here, uh, the, the raw iris data set um, is, is really a multi-class classification. So uh, it's got, um, if I remember right, it's got um, um, and it's described here. It's got four different features of, of flowers. Um, and in this data set, there are um, three classes. So it's, it's not binary. It's, it's, there's actually three possible outputs. So um, yeah, but, but uh, so yeah, the classes are it's either Restosa, Flower, that's, these are a particular type of flower, an iris. It's either a Setosa or a Versicolor or a Virginica or the three labels. But it, it is still a, a classification task, right? So the, the label, labels are discrete instead of being a regression task here. Um, but, you know, we could turn it into a binary class. So, for example, we can build a Virginica versus not Virginica classifier, which is uh, what we do here to start off, right? Um, So, uh, yeah, so I think what the labors are like one, two, or three. Um, so, um, where, where two is used for um, a Virginica. So, we can easily turn into a, a binary labels by just uh, getting all the things that are two. So, those will be one now in our Y labels. All the Virginica should be one, I guess, and all the other ones should be zero. We could fit a logistic regression. Oh, and we're also simplifying this in that um, um, I didn't mention it, but you know th there are four features, but we're going to reduce it to one feature for this first visualization. So we only use um, um, petal width, I guess, is the the feature at index column three uh, in this data here. Right. Um, so. What that means, if you fit a logistic regression, um, we can ask the like, we, like we can ask it to make per, uh, um, um, predictions. I thought we did that here somewhere uh, for like different values, right? So uh, an easy way to visualize a decision boundary, even if you have something more complex than this, is check it for different combinations of your feature. I've only got one feature at this point, right? So we can ask it to make a prediction. If the pedal width is 1.7, it predicts one, right? Predicts true. Or ask it to make a prediction if it's 1.5, predicts zero there, right? Um, So that's an easy way to figure out a decision boundary. So with just a single feature, um, I could try and uh, plot uh, the output. Remember the logistic regression is gonna give you a linear decision boundary. So it's gonna give you a line or a plane, like the like uh, linear regression uh, and logistic regression will also be a linear model here. Um, so, um, you know, we could just pick a bunch of points and, and, and plot those, and that would we'd be able to see the decision boundary because basically at the point where it changes from predicting zero to predicting one uh, is the place where it determined the decision boundary, um, the, the, the threshold for this. For, for this simplified problem here, we actually had, uh, these were some of the, the pedal widths that we had in, in here. Um, uh, and so it, there's no line that perfectly separates these because some of these um, uh, were um, not Virginica that had pedal widths that were a little bit bigger than 1.6. So it, it, it ended up with, uh, what was it, 1.6 something as the decision boundary. It was the best, um, uh, the best model for this data here. Right? Some of them, yeah, so... Uh, were a little bit bigger than that, so we won't be able to predict everything correctly. And some of the, the, the Virginica ones were a little bit smaller than that, that we get on the decision boundary. Um, so if you're, I mean, you know, 
a naive way the, the I'm working up to, so I think we show, yeah, we show some contour plots here, right? So, I mean, we could, we could visualize this by just plotting, you know, asking a model once we build it to give us the decision for values over the range, and then we can figure out where it changes, right? We're not exactly doing that. So, you know, there's an example of here's how we figure out the uh, decision bound value. So we're, we're querying the model um, to find the place where it, it uh, goes above 0.5, reason for the default threshold uh, in the model here. Um, but um, let me uh, just talk real quickly then about uh, this one here, because uh, I think uh, later on, uh, you will have to, I'll ask you to visualize some decision boundaries for a classifier um, where, uh, um, yeah, it's not so simple. So you have to, to use a, um, um, something like a, a plot, a contour plot like this. And you won't be able to, to analytically figure out what the decision boundary is um, to visualize it. So here, um, um, we made the problem a little bit bigger. So um, uh, we're still using Virginica, not Virginica, but we use, what, two parameters, pedal width and pedal width. Um, so um, again, it's it's going to be a line um, using basic logistic regression. So it's going to create a linear model. But um, 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 here, when we fit our data, you know, so, so we're using two features instead of one, but we're doing the same label of Virginica versus not Virginica. Um, but so I wanted to um, kind of show how this mention how this comp to a plot happens here. So notice what we're doing to, to generate the plot. Uh, we use this function called mesh grid. Uh, we give it two, basically two, two vectors. So one goes from 2.9 to 7, and the other one goes from 0 0.8 to 2.7. Um, and the first one has, we, we divide it into 500 points along that axis, and we divide it 200 on the other. I can't remember why we use that number of points, but, um, but that represents, so Basically, the, the mesh grid is creating all combinations of points uh, where X goes from the first one, I believe, um, you know, 2.9 to 7. So that's kind of why it ranges from 2.9 to 7 there. And the other one ranges from that one, right? But, but from those, the mesh grid is like, you know, um, uh, the, the combination of all those um, points at 2.9 with all the other points uh, in the other one, and then the one at 2.91 with all the others, right? So, so it's, it's a mesh of all those things. So we can use that, though, um, to visualize using uh, contour plots, uh, what we're doing in here, right? So the result of, um, of the x0 and the x1, um, um, if we plot a contour plot, um, is we will get lines that represent, uh, so I won't go into all the details here. So we do a couple of different things. So the, the one, the, the dash one represents the line where the output from the asking it to predict, uh, but we're not using the final prediction where it threshold it. We have to get the, the raw prediction from the signal, which should be a value from zero to one, right? So the dash line is the place uh, where we plot the contour plot where the predictions were 0 0.5 on the mesh grid. Yeah. Um, and, and these show the other, uh, a few other lines, right? So from 1.15 up to 0.9, um, we're showing contours here. Since this is a linear model, all the contours should be parallel. And so so uh, there'll, there'll be no nonlinearities in here. So all of them will be parallel to the 0.5, which is what we'll normally use as the decision threshold. For our, um, for our logistic uh, function here. But so th there's lots of details here, but but you know the point of that is I think the the um, um, important one here is that uh, um, Um, we, we do a lot of playing around with this, but but here's, I guess, the important thing to understand is we fit a logistic regression model 
So uh, we actually pass in the whole grid there. So, so this is a little, little bit of code that creates the whole grid of all possible points on the two dimensions, right? So we're asking it to predict, um, and by calling the, the prob A version of predict, we get the, the raw value before it goes to the signal A here. So we get a value somewhere between zero and one. Uh, but we'll get that result for every one of the possible uh, points in the two dimensions in this case. Right? Then the, the contour plot can use that. So basically it'll be able to figure out, so where is, uh, you know, for this one, where are the points on my mesh grid where the output from predicting prob A probability was 0.5. So they all ended up right there. Uh, there's gonna be a line for this model. And we get other contours here. So those other contours come from um, um, so yeah, the, the, the colored ones come from the first call to contour, um, and then the uh, other one here. Oh, um, um, yeah, I'd forgotten about this, uh, but we're actually showing um, extracting the, the same way that you had to do for the second assignment. Um, uh, so we do the same thing here as well. So you can just get the coefficients uh, and analytically determine that line. So that line, the, the dash line, is that place where those coefficients like I had to do for assignment two um, for the previous assignment uh, where they come out as 0.5. Uh, from predicting probability. So, um, um, so yeah, if you plot the coefficients and do the same calculation you did, um, you'll get that. But but that corresponds to the same things you would get from doing it more, uh, you know, the, using this mesh grid and contour plot. Um, all right, yeah. So that's kind of all I wanted to cover. We, we actually covered quite a bit of, of the stuff, but. Um, uh, let's go ahead and adjourn for the day. Uh, I'll let you guys go. There's there's some more stuff. Uh, I, I do have some things we'll talk about on Thursday, uh, but also I encourage you to you know get started on assignment if you haven't. Uh, so the first thing I'll try and do on Thursday is see if people want to ask me some questions or clarify anything about assignment three. All right. Yep. That's it. I'll see you guys on Thursday then.